Okay, uh, I'm going to start here with Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Are you so blind as to trifle with or to treat without gravity or seriousness the wealth of God's kindness? Are you so blind as to take for granted and despise the long-suffering of God? Are you so blind as to underestimate the patience of God? Are you ignorant of the fact that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repent? Are you unmindful of the fact that God's kindness is intended to change your mind as well as your inner man to accept God's will? God's kindness should cause you to change your mind. God's kindness should cause you to change your lifestyle. God's kindness should compel you to heartily amend your ways with abhorrence of past sins. Okay, Jude 1, verse 4. Jude 4. Ungodly and profane persons have stealthily crept into your assemblies, gaining entrance secretly by a side door. These people who are opposed to the purposes of God, they pervert the grace of our God in the lawlessness. Lawlessness is the removal of restraint and control. They pervert the favor of our God into wantonness, which is looseness and frivolity, or trivializing it, making light of it. They turn the kind, kindness of God into a trivial thing. And that's what I want to talk about. Trivializing the kindness of God. The goodness of God. I don't know. I, I, I guess it's human nature that, you know, some would call it spoiling, like spoiling one's children. But Hashem is so kind and good and gracious to man, to every man, that the temptation exists to trivialize his thing. Tony and I were following, <laughs> half-heartedly following someone who's giving dates and times for the rapture. <coughs> it's really sad. Well, the, the date that they gave came and went. And that these people predicted that Jesus would come back and and take us away. And, and, and the people who propagated this stupidity, this falsity, I mean, they're, they're acting like, what's the big deal? So we got it wrong. Oops. Yeah, so I got it wrong. Oops. What's, what's the big deal? God forgives me. God forgives me anyway. I'll, I'll just go confess my sin and he'll forgive me and I'll move on to my next project. They, they, they probably don't even see that they sin. No. They're 
understand how dare you scoffers how dare you disagree with us even though we're wrong <laughs> yeah hubris yeah don't take this age we're in for granted what I mean by that is don't take this dispensation that we are currently living in for granted it's coming to a close this dispensation we are living in is called the age of grace for a reason indeed God has and does freely freely bestow mercy and grace on us he has cleansed us of all unrighteousness he did it he did it he has bestowed upon us and even made us right not by anything we've done our righteousness is as filthy rags. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, it was through the substitutionary sacrifice and the resurrection of the Messiah. Grace. This is a dispensation. This is a period of time and space in which man has the privilege of a relationship, a covenant relationship, a sonship and daughtership relationship with God, free of charge. It's a gift. But you've seen it, I've seen it, spoiled children little children that's what these people who gave the time and date for the coming of Jesus on TikTok remind me of little children playing games with things they shouldn't yeah. trivializing grace even perverting it It means what it says, yeah, that it no means, man knows the data. Exactly. Yeshua even said, I don't even know it. Yeah. So why would he whisper it to, to one little person that calls himself a prophetess? There, do you see the lack of fear? Mm -hmm. And reverence. Do you see the lack of reverence? Yeah. Do you see the lack of comprehension of holiness? So, hey, I'm speaking to, to yours truly as well. It's human nature to take for granted the kindness and the goodness, the grace of our Heavenly Father. He didn't have to redeem us. You do know that. He did it out of the, the counsels and purposes of his own heart. He didn't have to go through literal hell for us to redeem us, to, to purchase our forgiveness. He didn't have to do that. Are you kidding? I wouldn't have. <laughs> No. I'm not as good as Hashem is. Looking in the mirror, I'm not worthy of it. None of us are worthy yeah. of his kindness. None of us. So let's not take it for granted. Yeah. Test the spirits. And if it contradicts the word of God, it can't be right. The written word of God. The written word of God.
No reverence. No reverence there. Again, talking about this isn't the first time I've seen this, by the way. Someone setting dates and times yeah, oh yeah. to get a following mm -hmm. uh, of the coming of the Lord. No reverence for the written word yeah. that men, not too long ago, just a few hundred years ago, not thousands, a few hundred years ago, men were executed in the most horrible ways you can imagine by church <laughs> for printing for printing and making available to every person in their language the the scripture men died to put that book in our hands no reverence at all no. for the holy written word. God didn't have to do that either. You know, make his word, his covenant available to us, to every man. Not just priests and pastors. And right. Yes. But he did. And it's something to be reverenced. Well, something else that trivializes God's kindness and goodness and forgiveness, and that's kind of what I want to center on, forgiveness, is when authority figures, moral authority figures, <clears throat> seem to propagate this idea that you are under obligation to forgive someone who wronged you no, with, with no conditions. Freely. No repentance on their part. No restitution on their part. You just forgive everybody for everything. Because, hey, that's what God did, right? God forgave me freely. No. No. He did not. No, there was an awful price to be paid for my forgiveness, yeah. for your forgiveness. Awful price. I, I went through the book of Leviticus the last couple of days. What I did, I went to Bible Gateway, the search engine, and typed in the word forgiveness, or forgive. And I went through the book of Leviticus in which that word forgive was used. And throughout the entire book, particularly chapters 4 and 5 of Leviticus, You'll read verse after verse after verse of instructions to the priests regarding the sacrifice of innocent animals for the atonement of sins, which led to the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness was not cheap under the Old Covenant. They would sacrifice lambs, bulls, goats, birds, living things, 
innocent creatures, innocent blood being shed, being poured out of these defenseless, innocent, keyword innocent there, innocent animals. Millions of them. In order to purchase. Not free. To purchase. Forgiveness. Blood. Not money, not stuff, not flowery words, not a bunch of lip service. No, it took blood to purchase forgiveness. Do you understand what I'm saying? Blood is it is sacred. And this was innocent blood. These are yes. innocent animals. Yes. They were sacrificed on behalf of people to whom God forgave. But it wasn't free. That bull crying out in fear and terror while it's being sacrificed, don't tell him it was free. Don't tell that poor innocent lamb who's... I'm not even going to go into how they sacrificed him. Don't tell that poor innocent lamb who's being sacrificed on the altar yeah. that forgiveness is cheap. It cost him everything. It cost that lamb everything. And, or, and he didn't do a thing. Yeah. Just to buy forgiveness. And don't tell my Savior and my King, Yeshua, that forgiveness was cheap. It caught, he shed his blood to purchase forgiveness. So perhaps with perhaps this is why. I don't know. I get kind of miffed. <laughs> if not outright indignant and angry at this idea that I'm supposed to just forgive anybody and everybody for anything and everything they do to me or anyone else in my circle. I don't look at forgiveness as something that's cheap or trivial. You don't owe forgiveness to anybody. You don't owe forgiveness to anybody. No. But unfortunately, the narc mm -hmm. thinks you do. Be because be, yeah, he's a pulpit narc, and, and why wouldn't he? Why why wouldn't the narcissists in our society today? We have a whole generation of them. You can't escape them. We have a whole generation of people who have trivialized and made light of the forgiveness, the kindness, the goodness, the graciousness of God. 
There's no fear of God left. You're not going to find it in the modern church. I'm going to read Romans 2, 4 again. They don't treat with gravity or seriousness the wealth of God's kindness. They don't take His kindness seriously. They don't take the long-suffering of God seriously. I'm talking about the teachings that come forth from many, not all, but many religious institutions. And you know this. So we have a whole generation that just takes for granted things like, you're not supposed to judge me. Listen, if, if I want to dress up like a woman and read stories to your children in a school that your tax dollars are paying for, I'm going to do it. You can't judge me. Now, that's an example that everyone can understand, I think, who has any, any light in them at all. Yeah. But I could talk about the malignant narcissist husband who beats his wife emotionally, spiritually, physically. This guy, the wife beater, he, he not only inwardly has, has no, what's the word, no sense of abhorrence, no sense of wrong about what he's doing to his wife. His conscience does not bother him. In fact, abuse is a virtue. It's something to be proud of to the malignant narcissist. I talked about that yesterday. He has, there, there's no concept at all in his heart and mind that when he abuses his wife, it's wrong. Inwardly. That's bad enough. But Mr. Wife Beater, especially if he goes to church, modern church, he's got the backing of the whole church behind him. He, he's, he laughingly, I'm sure, he, he, he is just utterly gleeful about the fact that church teaches not to judge, to forgive freely, to love unconditionally. When his abused wife even lifts a finger to object to his behavior toward her, he'll just point to the lesson that Sunday when they went to church and say, you need to forgive me, sister. You're judging me. How dare you? You see, that's a perversion of forgiveness. That's a perversion of God's grace. That's cheapening and trivializing forgiveness. I guess what I'm trying to say is internally he feels no remorse whatsoever for the way he abuses and tortures his wife. 
And there's no one among the moral authority figures of the day and of that generation who are putting any restraints on his behavior either. The, the restraint, the restraint is on his victim. Mm -hmm. She's the one under restraint. She's the one being told to change her attitude and her behavior. That's called perversion. Perversion simply means to twist, to call good bad, and to call bad good. Now, I want to talk about why it is futile to show kindness to an abusive person. What you need to do, what the Bible teaches us to do, is to cut him off. Like you would cut your hand off if it offends you. Or you would pluck your eye out if it offends you. Or if it offends God. You need to, as you would a thorn bush or a weed, dig it up and remove it by the roots and throw it in an oven and take care of it. And here's why. It, it, it's an act of utter futility, if not folly, to it to attempt kindness, to show kindness and forgiveness on a wicked man, on a malignant narcissistic man or woman, because they don't repent. They can't. Let me just read you this type of person who we are not to show kindness and forgiveness to the way the modern church teaches us. It's found in Ephesians 4.18, and this is a definition of a malignant narcissist. They're, a malignant narcissist is someone whose moral understanding is darkened. He has no moral understanding. He just doesn't get it. Oh, he knows what he does is morally unacceptable to others. But inside himself, he is completely blind to why what he's doing is wrong. Like I said before, like the scripture teaches, he glories in it. His moral reasoning is beclouded. Again, I'm reading from Ephesians 4.18. He's alienated. Key word right here. The malignant narc is alienated, estranged, <coughs> and self-banished from the life of God. He has no share in it. He's been banished. He's estranged from God's life, God's knowledge, God's light. He is, again back to Ephesians, he's willfully, spiritually blind with a blindness deep-seated in him due to hardness of heart. He has willfully rejected the knowledge of God due to the insensitiveness of his moral nature. He's callous and past feeling. Past feeling. And it ain't coming back. Feeling in this scripture, in this verse of Ephesians, also would refer to empathy. He is past the ability. He no longer has any ability to empathize. Now, 
This in turn leads to recklessness an abandonment of oneself to unbridled sensuality. He, there's no brakes. The brakes are off. There's no restraint. The faculty of conscience is no longer operative in his life. I say this because as we read in Romans chapter 2 verse 4 the ver the scripture I opened with he Paul states that the kindness of God the forbearance of God is is intended the purpose of God's kindness is to lead a man or a woman to repent to change their mind, to change their life in conformity to God's will, to have an abhorrence, an absolute loathing and hatred of the sin and the abuse they perpetrated on those they victimized, on their victims. And the kindness of God is to lead a desire in the heart and the mind of someone to, at all cost, offer restitution to the person they hurt, even if it costs them everything. But this doesn't happen with an, a wicked man or a malignant narcissist. They are incapable of repentance. They've become judicially blind. The wrath of God has been revealed to them, against them. They've been judged. The millstone around the neck judgment. Their conscience is permanently sealed. Well, how do I know someone who's in this condition? How can you tell? It's easy to tell. Someone who consistently, pervasively, persistently abuses in any fashion, whether it's physical or not. Someone who's innocent, defenseless, helpless, childlike, Anyone who gets off hurting someone like that are in this condition. This condition of a calloused, hardened heart that is incapable of repentance regardless of how much kindness and forgiveness and goodness you show upon them. And by you or I trying to love a wicked man into the kingdom, we run a risk. We run the risk of trivializing God's kindness when we do that. God's kindness was bought with a price, which was blood, his blood. But his kindness and mercy is also given to us with an expectation from God of repentance. Amen? Amen. Amen.